<laughs> Actually, you can give me presents. Feel free to give me presents at every moment. Because every moment is my birthday because I've taken so many births. And you can give me presents for the future because I'll be probably taking a few million more births. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There's your first present. Yeah, you want to uh, let me get the, the microphone. Yeah. Just hold it one second. Yeah. Hey, Krishna. Yeah. 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 By getting Gurudev's uh, Shiksha. Okay. Uh, a long time ago, when she first began, um, she worked on the Krishna book paintings. And uh, when I joined the temple in Boston, I remember that the Boston temple was decorated with all these wonderful pictures of Krishna. Very very simple, you could almost say at the time, almost naive, if you understand the word naive art style. From those early days, her work has matured and deepened, uh, both in terms of her technical ability, but also, of course, in terms of her understanding of, of Siddhanta. And in all of her pieces, we see an amazing display of Krishna consciousness. Uh, we're able to witness these sublime pastimes of Radha and Krishna, Krishna and Arjuna, all of the different pastimes of Krishna. Oh, never mind, I'll just ask them where you do it. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be a real treat for you to hear her comments on how she's painted them, the instructions that Srila Gurudev has given her in painting them. And I won't keep you any longer, except to say that one of the reasons why she's making this presentation today is that at some time in the near future, all of these paintings are going to be made available to the devotee community to buy. Actually, buy is not really the right word, because you can't really buy something like this. There isn't enough money. To, to own one of these paintings. We were asking ourselves the other day, well, how much are one of these paintings worth? Someone said $20,000, and somebody went, no way! <clears throat> they're worth way more than that. And someone said, well, yes, I think they're worth at least $300,000. <laughs> and of course, in a sense, they're worth an unbelievable amount of money, because if you go out into the, uh, the ordinary fruitive world, you have artists that are making things that are just self-indulgent, abstract, mayavad, rooted pieces of art, and they're selling for millions of, millions of dollars. These pieces of, of art are more than pieces of art. They're actually deities. When Shamarani's painting these paintings, She's meditating deeply on these pastimes under Guru Dave's instructions. <laughs> Isn't that true, or is that, are you going to tell me I'm wrong? It's, true. it's not true. Okay. No, you're not. Wrong. Well, that's good for the PR. We want everybody to think that she's deep in meditation. I know better. I know better. I've been in. I I painted with Shamarani in L.A. years ago uh, during the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, what, what was it? Marathon. Marathon. I was, I was, factory came to mind, but it, it was kind of like a factory. We had many different artists all painting together, and uh, what came out of that was something that Shamarani calls production, what it, production line paintings. But at any rate, I had the chance to sit by her and watch her and watch the dedication and, and the commitment, and, and I learned a lot about painting from her as well. So I've had a special mercy in that sense of having her association and, and in seeing how she goes about actually painting these things. So I know better, but we won't go into that. So we're going to make these paintings available to the devotee community. And, you know, we don't know uh, what 
let's say, monetary value will come from them. Uh, but what's important is that the exchange that we'll be making with the persons who uh, give some donation for them and take them to their home. And G. Clays would also go to Navadweep. Uh, yes, I was just going. I was just going to come on to that. Um, <clears throat> what what will actually be taking place is the person will be making a donation to the building of Srila Gurudev's temple in Navadweep. So you win both ways. You get a chance to make a nice donation for your eternal benefit and for the eternal benefit of all living entities to build a temple in the Holy Dham under the auspices of a Rasik Mahabhagwat Vaishnava. So who can calculate that benefit? And then of course you have a chance to take one of these paintings home and live with the paintings in your home and worship the paintings and have these paintings uh, inspire you and inspire your Krishna consciousness and inspire all the people that come to visit you. So we're, sorry? And in future generations you'll pass them on. I mean, they're already worthy of being in a, in a museum, but you know, that's not how we live. We don't put our, the things that we hold near and dear in museums. We like to live with them and worship them and be inspired by them. So you can pass them on to future generations. I've had uh, the pleasure of having some of uh, the BBT paintings in my personal possession in the past. Uh, paintings of Mahadev and, and others. And I can tell you, <clears throat> having a painting on your wall like this in your home completely transforms your your house even if that's the only thing you have in your house it, it completely transforms your house and your life you mentioned that uh, paintings are like deities when i first met prophet in 1969 yes. uh, you mentioned that these paintings are like deities when i first met Srila prophet in 1969 he had the deities uh, to his right the Vyasa son was here and the devotees were to his left and in front of him was one of Shamar, uh, Jadarani, Shamarani's Anjatapa paintings. And I remember in the lecture Srila Prabhupada said, um, you should not think that these paintings are ordinary paintings. And then he quoted the sloka, which I should know, that says that Krishna can incarnate into seven material elements, jewel, uh, stone, wood, the mind, Paint, painting, and uh, metal, and one other. I should learn that slogan. So, but the point is that uh, they're not, they're deities by, uh, by, um, it, it's a fact, it's a Shastric fact. So. Thank you. I, to, to take up on that point, when I joined the Boston Temple, uh, I remember on our altar was one of Shamarani's painting, paintings of the Panchatattva. And, and that's what we, we worshipped uh, uh, every day. So, wonderful pieces of art, aesthetic value, pleasant to look at. Who can calculate the, you know, what, they're re what they're really worth? Nevertheless, at some point, some of you out there, whether here in the audience or those who uh, actually end up viewing the, the CD of this uh, presentation, you're going to have the chance to own these. Uh, we're not sure how we're going to do that. Uh, we're talking about the best way to go about that. But at any rate, we felt that by making this presentation, we would create some excitement, some anticipation, hopefully a little bit of anxiousness out there that yes, I want to have one of these wonderful pieces of art, and somehow or another, I'm going to beg, borrow, and steal <laughs> in, in order to be able to get, in order to be able to have one. So without, uh, one last thing, um, regardless of how much they go for, and we're anticipating some very large donations for them, by the way, so, uh, you know, don't hold back, don't hold back at six figures. Feel free to move on. Um, but for those devotees who aren't, uh, let's say, uh, 
endowed with those kinds of material blessings, um, where you can still have access to these paintings. And we're going to have uh, collector's quality, limited edition prints of all of these paintings made according to a very, very high standard of technology that uh, uses uh, uh, high resolution scans and then uh, prints them out on something called a gicle, which means that if you held up the print next to the original, you wouldn't be able to see any difference at all. They're, and they're actually printed on canvas. You can have them printed on canvas, or you can have them printed on high quality fine art paper, whichever one you want. These will be made available at more affordable prices, prices that people like me can afford. So there's nothing to worry about. Everyone can participate in this. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll be an auction or a bidding or, or how it'll be done, but everyone can participate in this. And uh, so therefore, without further ado, I'd like to turn the, uh, the presentation over to Shamarani, and I'm sure that uh, you're about to taste a lot of transcendental nectar, transcendental birthday nectar. Haribo. Kauma gyanam timirandasya gyanam jana salakaya Chaksuran militam yena tasmai sri gurave nama Gurave gura chandraya radhikaya itvadalaye Krishnaya krishna bhaktaya tada bhaktaya namo nama Yang pravrajanta manupeta mapeta krityam Dvai payano viraka taru ajuhava Putre titan mayataya taramo venedas Tang sarva puta hridayam muni manatosmi Bhaktyavahina parada lakshay Chittasya kamadita ranga madhye Kripa mai tvam sharanam prapadyam Prinde namaste charanara vindam Tavai vasmi tavai vasmi Najivami tam vina Iti vigyaya radhe tam nayamam charanantike First I offer my unlimited obeisances in the dust of the lotus feet of my most worshipable Diksha Gurudev. Nichilila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pad Astotara Satishri Srimad Srila Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada and the same unlimited obeisances in the dust of the lotus feet of my most worshipable Shiksha Gurudev. Om Vishnu Pad Astotra Satasri Srimad Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Gosai Maharaj to all of our Guru Varga, Disciplic Succession, and all the assembled devotees. Uh, Buddhara Prabhu was bringing back old memories of Srila Prabhupada as he guided us to make uh, paintings, or as he called them, windows to the spiritual sky. So, uh, just to let you know that in Houston, in two weeks, uh, we'll be having a presentation with slideshow of the whole history of Srila Prabhupada and the art, and he, how he guided the art during his manifest stay. And we may also do this again also in Houston. So, um, we'll go over the drawings and paintings as a chronology in terms of when it happened. In 1993, Srila Gurudev asked me, because I had shown him some weeks just prior to that, some old slides of my paintings that I had done under Srila Prabhupada's guidance, not anticipating anything because I thought association with Gurudev meant no work, just bhajan. But I just showed it to him for uh, just some banda. 
Then uh, he asked me one day, can you paint my heart? So uh, I didn't know what to say. So he brought me into the next room. This was in Matura when he was on the second floor. And he showed me um, a very large painting that an Indian person had done in the Indian uh, stylized way. He said, I paid 3,000 rupees for this, but it's not at all to my liking. Radharani looks too old and the proportions aren't nice. So can you do a nicer version? So in the discussion with Guru Dave, it came out that if I were to change one thing on that painting, everything else would look worse and I'd have to keep going around changing everything. Oh, I'll do this one now. So this one can go behind here. So um, this is how it finally came out. But it started with, and you've all seen this, but this is a new print that was just made in India. And they're available down the bottom of the hill for the rest of the festival. So um, this started with showing Gurudev drawings. And he would say, no, Radharani doesn't look realistic there. Oh, yeah, somebody else can. Thanks. Radharani doesn't look realistic there, or she looks too heavy set, or she looks too old. And so right from the very beginning of the drawing, it was on Srila Gurudev's guidance. And in case I forget to mention it later, because I'm remembering it now, the conversations that I'm telling you in brief about how this painting was developed and what Buddhara Prabhu said was right, not only with uh, Srila Prabhupada, but also with Srila Gurudev, that particularly referring to this picture, Gurudev said, this is not a picture, this is Archivigraha. And the uh, worth is lakhs and lakhs of dollars, or unlimited. Uh, and it came out of his heart. At, when the painting was almost finished, because every time I looked at it, it looked different from what I did. It kept changing itself, and the face, facial features kept moving around, and there's ten legs under that one. I just Everything I did was wrong. Or it seemed right at the moment, and then the next day I came in to look at it, it was wrong. So then four and a half months down the line, and I was working many, many hours a day on it, but it was just looking like paint. And then towards the end, um, Gurudev uh, called me from Vrindavan to Matra, and he said, um, wherever you can find room, not to make it congested, but wherever you can find room, I want you to put like shadows, the manjaris looking in and watching and waiting for their turn to come, to come in and do their service. They don't have to be called. Just by uh, seeing the various ecstasies and hearing the discussion between Radha and Krishna, they would know exactly when the right moment to come in is, to help Krishna in his services to Radharani like you see on the sides, some uh, jars and plates of paraphernalia, like uh, kumkum and aguru and tambul. These are all various um, unguents that Krishna will serve Srimati Radhika with. And they know exactly the right moment to come and give it to them and bring him more service articles. Uh, and Radharani then would be Krishna's uh, worshipable deity. So it was almost the end of the painting, four and a half months, and uh, so then I put them in, I put the manjaris in, and then I asked them, uh, can this be so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so manjari and so-and-so? He said, yes. I said, is that my kalpana, my imagination? He said, no, that's yoga maya, that's so-and-so. And I said, can I tell anybody who they are? And he said, no, they will have to realize by their own bhajan who those manjaris are. Then, some, then as soon as they were there, then the whole painting started. I was the same me doing my uh, strokes into the darkness. 
But then, just by them being there, the whole painting started moving in the right place by itself, which indicates that only by their mercy can one enter into the service of Radha and Krishna. Then, towards the very end, when there was only a few days left, um, uh, he told me to put the uh, two very significant lockets on, or necklaces, on Radha and Krishna. On him is the um, Kostaba gem, which is, he said, make it more brilliant than millions of suns, and like with rainbow-like colors. And on Srimati Radhika, on her neck, is the famous Shamantaka jewel, which uh, came from the head of the demon, uh, Sankachuda. And then Krishna wanted to give it to Radharani, but he didn't want to uh, make any of the other gopis jealous, so he gave it to uh, Balaram, because he knows Balaram knows his heart. Balaram gave it to Madhu Mangala, Madhu Mangala gave it to Lalita, and Lalita gave it to Radhika. So in this way, Krishna avoided any incidents. So that also is more brilliant than millions of suns, and with all the colors of the rainbow in it. Then at that, on that meeting, and I would bring it to him every two or three days, sometimes, uh, those of you who've been in India, you know about the auto rickshaws, so we would put, it's a very large painting, about five feet long, and we put it sticking out the two sides of the auto rickshaw, and drive it, of course, in a, in a very strong cardboard, uh, not cardboard, but wooden crate type of effect to protect it. And uh, every two or three days, we would travel from Vrindavan to Mathura to get further um, guidance from Srila Gurudev. We brought it to Bombay when he was giving lectures there, everywhere, so that he could keep making the pictures. In Bombay, that's when he told us to put Bailey, uh, Jewy, that is, um, jasmine flowers and other kind of flowers in her hair. So at the very end, when we were meeting about the lockets, I said, I don't understand this. This painting has taken me five months to do. And all the previous ones I did for the BBT during Srila Prabhupada's time only took maybe a month, sometimes in marathon times, two weeks. So why did this painting take so long? So he said, your previous paintings were done by your will, but this one was done by my will, and I had to push my will through your will. <laughs> and that's why it took so long. Now, all the details of the Vigraha, we'll say, are under Gurudev's guidance, because he manifested the picture from his heart, uh, including Krishna's purplish, transparent shirt, Gurudev said that if a young boy wears a transparent shirt, it looks very beautiful. And who do you think posed for Radha and Krishna? Of course, uh, Gurudev told me to get one of these little, like, one rupee pictures, because Vrindavan artists had been trying to do this picture very traditionally for so many years. And this is the picture you find in actually the place of Radha and Krishna's Rasalila pastimes the um, thousands of years old or eternal Seva Kunj in Vrindavan, which is just a couple of blocks from our Rupsanat and Gaudiyamat, where on the second floor uh, this Vigraha is situated. And uh, Srila Gurudev performed one evening a Pran Pratista ceremony, as one does for the deities, installing this Vigraha and also Rupa Manjari and Rati Manjari with Arti and... Uh, kirtan and mantras. Um, and since then, they're treated as deities just as uh, Radha Vinod Bihariji downstairs on the first floor with regular artis, putting them to rest, waking them up, and uh, boga <coughs> offerings. And Gurudev ordered when the painting was finished that they put be put in this room on the second floor, which would become... Uh, the altar, and he uh, ordered us to get life-size deer and peacocks and um, like a forest of, you know, hanging creepers and bracelets and perfumes, just as it would be in Seva Kunj or Niruvan. 
Um, so Gurudev posed for Krishna because we had these little pictures that they sold in Loy Bazaar, but they were very stiff and didn't have the subtleties of this. She was turned in a different way. She was looking at Krishna with a smile, but that's not uh, the mood of our Guru Parampara. So Gurudev posed both for Krishna and for Srimati Radhika. Which jewels are the jewels you described? Because the one on Krishna's chest right here and the one on Radharani's neck. Uh, it's hard to see, but probably the big pearl looking thing. And on Radharani, the first necklace that you come to, I think. The second. Second. It's kind of a darkish gem. Uh, I'd have to see. Can you just turn it Actually. Yeah, probably. I think it's the darkish one, probably. Um, so, yeah. So, in case I forget to mention it later, the conversations that I'm discussing now, um, why, how is it that it's so much easy for my memory since it happened in 1993? One of the reasons is that we used to record, well, now still everybody records what Gurudev says, but we would record every conversation so that I could hear it again and again as the paintings developed. And then we transcribed them. So the Harikata began in those days. And so we made up, at that time, uh, the conversations with the dates and the places. Sometimes they're just very small like this, and then you go on to the next one. So if somebody would volunteer um, at the end of the class to uh, Xerox them, then uh, in a day or so we can give them out to anybody who requests them. And similarly, in case I forget to mention it later, um, as you know, there are also paintings of Rupa Manjari and Sri Rati Manjari on the two sides of Seva Kunj, which many of you have on your altars. And the conversations that led up to those uh, vigrahas manifesting are also recorded and on here. So if anybody would like to uh, Xerox 50 or however many copies, or a couple of people would like to help with that, then we can distribute them freely to the devotees. <coughs> so as I mentioned, all the details of this vigraha came from Srila Gurudev's, of course, heart and words. Regarding the two parrots that are sitting up on the branch, one is Sukha and one is Sadi. And you can read a very elaborate their conversation in excerpts from Govinda Lilamrita. But in short, uh, the Sukha, the male parrot, is uh, explaining in various ways how Krishna is superior to Radharani. And the Sari, the female parrot, is uh, expressing the superiority of Srimati Radhika. And then Gurudev said, finally, they come to a compromise that together they're both supreme. And on both sides of their throne are um, Tulsi, big Tulsi plants. And Gurudev said to make the uh, Kudamba trees with uh, creepers surrounding them. And that uh, symbolizes or is a uh, udipan or a stimulus to Radha and Krishna, that Krishna wants Srimati Radhika to be like the creeper and Krishna like the tree. Um, let's see, is there any more on that? Yes. Uh, Gurudev said, lakhs and lakhs, that is hundreds and thousands or millions or unlimited pastimes belong to this scene. But one of them is, um, in one of the visits I made and showed him the picture, he said that um, Krishna was worried that Radharani's main nature is um, Bhamyabhav, 
that is contrary nature, playing hard to get. But now she's so um, easygoing and submissive. This does not make her, this does not give her her highest happiness or me the highest happiness. So he's thinking what to do to um, inspire her normal mood. So he pretended to commit an offense and he came late. And on top of coming late, uh, he pretended that he was thinking of Chandravali while looking at Radharani. So he said, Oh, my dear Chandra Anani. <laughs> because Chandra Anani means one whose uh, face is as beautiful as many moons, and Chandravali means uh, like a beautiful moon like creeper. And that refers to Radharani's rival, who's only her uh, expansion anyway. So. Radharani was already in a rejecting mood, and now it's total rejection. <laughs> then you can just go back there, and I don't want to have any relationship with you anymore. <coughs> she said, I can see why you have these beautiful colors on your face, like red and uh, purple. You look like Neil, Neil, Arud, Neil Rudra. Neil uh, means... Uh, like a purple rudra means like Lord Shiva. Oh, you look just like Lord Shiva, purplish blue. Because uh, I can tell you've been with some other gopi, and that's how you got all these signs on your face. But what really happened is, Krishna gets so absorbed in Radharani, he totally loses himself and forgets who he is. As uh, you've been hearing in the last couple of nights, Krishna is a Dwayagan Padatattva, Everything is in him, everything is emanating from him, and yet when he looks at Radharani, he forgets who he is. He just gets lost in her. And because um, he's absolute, he's non-different from his thoughts, so he's so absorbed in her that the thoughts of her go on his body. So it's actually her eyeliner and her lipstick that's now on him, from his absorption, and she's saying, I know why that's there, and you can just go back to where you came from. <laughs> um, and then Krishna is going like this. Oh, so Lalita is convincing her. He was just a moment late. He never thinks of anybody else anyway, but in front of you he especially can't remember any other gopi. So then she said, finally, after much coaxing from her sakis, she says, okay, uh, I'll forgive him, but he has to beg pardon and serve my feet and paint my feet. So Krishna um, becomes thrilled. This is his desire. So he takes a paintbrush made of a peacock feather, the end of a peacock feather, or a brush, uh, a soft brush, and he writes his name. You'll see his name on the on her lotus feet, around her toes and uh, on the bottom, because he knows better than anybody that Nam and Nami are one. Myself and my name are non-different. So if I put my name there at her feet, then I'll be there forever. So, but as soon as he started touching her feet, his heart immediately started trembling and his hands started trembling. So what came out was an art. Not exactly a neat name, but like an art. And Gurudev said, don't make it like a heebie-jeebie, like too congested, but make it his name, but like an art. You can imagine if God is writing and he's trembling in ecstasy, what kind of artful thing that would be. And then Gurudev also said to, um, he gave me a picture, a Xerox picture. He immediately sent out one of his brahmacharis, uh, from his book to get a Xerox picture of her hand. You know how they have these black line drawings of the, um, what do you call those, markings of her hand. He said, don't put them all in because then it will become too congested. But make a few that will look nice. So if you look close, you see some markings on her, auspicious markings on her hand. And uh, I think that will be the end for this picture because there are so many others. He said, this picture will be famous all over the world. Yeah. That was his foretelling. He made it happen. Yeah.
Oh, she has a shawl like this, but you notice that it's a see-through shawl because the gopis are very chaste and si simultaneously very revealing at the same time. Yes? Millions and unlimited pastimes. Well, that's one of them that he told. There are so many. Yeah, that, that's a, you can call that a prominent one. Well, he's told everybody more, and they're in so many books also. Maybe as we discuss the other uh, paintings, we'll also mention more. What are the square things in the little plate? There's like three of them. That's uh, tambul or uh, pan. It's made of um, what kind? Betel nut leaves and some spices inside. And I once asked Gurudev uh, regarding that, that they took, that they both, and the other gobis also, they eat betel nut leaves, which are an intoxicant, you know, like people chew pan, and so their teeth are all red in India. It's an intoxicant. So why do Radha and Krishna need to take an intoxicant to um, increase their preem? Like people in the material world, they get drunk and then they have all kinds of loving relations. So, and, and also, why do they drink um, honey wine also, which is made of honey and um, the juice, mixed with the juice of different fruits? So Gurudev said, they're not getting intoxicated by the betel nuts or by the honey wine, because the honey wine and the betel nuts are just made of the forest of Vrindavan, and the forest of Vrindavan is just an emanation of their own prem. So it's their prem itself, Mahabhav, and her Madanakyambhav, which is uh, already the highest ecstasy in prem, uh, the highest intoxicated ecstasy, maddened ecstasy, and it's increasing unlimitedly. It's already unlimited, yet it's increasing unlimitedly at every moment. And they just use these things as a excuse, excuses. Because every th in existence, there's only Radha and Krishna. Shakti and Shakti Man. And they expand as everything else to expand their pastimes. Okay, then I don't see the... Um... Can we finish about the veil? Oh, that's right. So the veil is transparent. So she's looking away from him, rejecting him. But she's also glancing at him with her sidelong glance. And Prabodhananda Saraswati Thakur sang, or wrote, that with simply her sidelong glance, Krishna faints, his peacock feather falls from his hands, his um, pitambra, his robe falls from his shoulders, and he's just about to faint, and he does faint. So what to speak of if she would look at him head on? So she's giving him the sidelong glance there. And Gurudev said, this is Kila Kinchitibhav, it's a combination of apparently contradictory moods of simultaneously crying and smiling and anger and flirtation. And both Krishna and Radha are um, experiencing that Kila And the, yes? Yes? Um, somebody told me that at that point Krishna became so stunned and amazed that he decided he would like to taste can you speak louder? Somebody told me that Krishna became so amazed at um, what he was seeing that he, he decided he wanted to taste what Srimati Radharani was tasting and decided to advent himself as, uh, in Kali Yuga. Is this correct? Well, something like that. He, those are his three desires. He becomes so overwhelmed by her love and her, uh, her ability to taste in him what he can't taste and her happiness, that's 10 million times more than his, that, um, that he came as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sometimes he's looking at himself in a mirror or in a reflected pillar, and he becomes so overwhelmed and enchanted by his own image that, he, that desire increases to the point where he wants to love him like Srimati Radhika, and that makes him uh, want to become Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. There's so many ways to see it. Yes? The thought that's achieved in the, in the Seva Kingdom, when, when the Mahaprabhu is 
What Krishna desired to achieve is achieved as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, so he, he, he has all the same, uh, the as Krishna has all the same emotions and moods as Srimati Radhika, almost. He can never be Radhika. He, can, he experiences her Madanaki Mahabhav to his fullest extent but he can never become her. She always remains as a separate person and watches him in the form of Gadadhar Pandit. Yes, his desires are fully fulfilled. He experiences all her moods. In fact, what we don't know, when I said almost, I just meant that he doesn't become her. He can't take her moods because some people say he stole her moods and that's why he's called Gorda Hari. But he can never steal her moods because she's always too alert, because she's his intelligence. She's his intelligence. She's the embodiment of his intelligence. He, like we adopt the mood of our Gurudev, we want to. But still he has his mood. We couldn't take it from him. What does that say? Oh, Gornitai. Where is Gornitai? Oh, so then, the, but then just quickly, the next two paintings were Rupa and Rati Mandris. And uh, if we had them here, they are here? Oh, they're very small. Okay, we'll discuss Gornatai first and then go to Rupa and Rati. Um, I just have to change the tape. Okay. Um, 